also have a number of DSA members who have been uh, working since December to put this event on. Um, and it would, uh, we'd be here all night if I tried to name everybody who participated. Uh, because there's way too many of you and that's one of the best things ever and one of the things I love about working with DSA. Um, but I do want to uh, mention the contributions of uh, Amy Tran uh, yeah, and <laughs> Bree Richardson. We also have our panelists, uh, Munira Mohammed from the Racial Justice Branch. We have Diana Walter from Socialist Feminists. Um, and we also have Dave Camper, who uh, is from the labor branch, and unfortunately he's not feeling well today, so he's not going to be able to join us. But he did send some questions, so I'm going to be reading those out. Um, we also want to thank a, f um, yeah, a few other members. Um, well, yeah, I think we'll, we'll leave it at that, but uh, thank you to everybody from DSA Seriously who, who uh, helps put this on, because it's not something that one or two people could have done alone. Yes. Okay. Um, I also have a few uh, sort of housekeeping announcements. Um, IBEW 292 would like to let everybody know that uh, you can go to our website to find out more about uh, labor history events, which we do every month. Um, the bathrooms are uh, downstairs and to the right. Um, you, you, when you sat down, you probably found a DSA survey on your chair. so. Um, if you uh, would fill those out and return them to the DSA table, uh, Nick, you want to give everybody a wave? This is this this is Nick, our uh, our twin, one of our Twin Cities DSA co-chairs. So you can return those surveys to him. Um, there's also uh, copies of the book for sale in the back, and we also have some snacks in the back, which are free. So help yourself. Um, and then the last thing before we get started is uh, Peter wants to come up and say a few words about the library and welcome you all here. Yes, welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, I guess it's a nice problem for those of us who do have chairs uh, that there aren't enough chairs for all the people who are here. Um, but I want to welcome everyone. Um, how many of you are here for the first time? Wow. Okay. So uh, I hope you'll come back. Um, we are four and a half years old. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We're focused on the intersections of immigration history and labor history, the intersections of feminism and racial justice. Um, we have now 20,000 books uh, focused in immigration, labor, and social justice history, and fiction, poetry, theater, uh, visual art, other ways that the stories of immigrants and working people have been told. Um, we do a great deal of programming. Um, tomorrow night we are opening an exhibit by a Hmong photographer, uh, Pao Hua Her, called The Fruits of My Mother's Labor. Um, Saturday afternoon we have a group of English language learner students from Washington High School presenting digital videos about their community's experiences here in the Twin Cities and across the world. Um, Saturday night we have an event with the Twin Cities Japanese American Citizens League uh, observing the Day of Remembrance, the anniversary of Franklin Delano Roosevelt signing Executive Order 9066 that incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans. So we've got lots of things going on here. Um, I hope you'll come back. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do when we get the great opportunity to have an author like Eric here in town um, is to get other people to read the book and engage with, uh, with that author. And so it's great that we have people here who are ready to press him, I hope, uh, on his conclusions and arguments. Um, and hopefully that will engage and involve everyone. So uh, we were delighted to be able to work with DSA on this project. Um, please do, if you don't sign our guest book, sign there. Uh, Nick's signing sheet so that we're able to stay in touch with you um, and come back. And, and also, if you have ideas, the reason this event is happening is that Joanna and Amy and Bree came to other events here and, and asked if they could do this here. And 
So maybe there's some other idea that you have for something you would like to do, and that's why the Eastside Freedom Library is here. And, and so much for the naysayers out there who say that socialism doesn't belong in the United States, huh? Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing to see so many of you on a night that many people might have thought Minnesotans would throw another log on the fire and stay home. So it's inspiring to stand here and see all of you. So thank you. Joanna, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, before we get rolling, there is one chair here in the front row. So for those of you who are standing, um, there's a chair. Uh, it looks like... Yeah, there are a few chairs. So if you have an empty chair by you, could you raise your hand, please? There, yeah, there's also some back here that you can't see. So if you're standing and want a seat, please come up. Um, okay, great. So our format tonight is going to be uh, that we are going to have uh, Eric Loomis speak about uh, his book, for, uh, for a period, and then we're going to have each of our panelists give uh, a response to the book and uh, ask some questions. Um, and after that, then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, so um, thank you so much for coming. This is Eric Loomis. We're going to have him talk about his book. Well, uh, uh, thank, first of all, thank you all for having me. Uh, I hope uh, I, I usually don't get accused of speaking too softly, but uh, if anybody can't hear me, uh, please uh, raise your hand or whatever, and I will speak louder. So, I, I mean, the first thing is I, I just want to thank Joanna and Peter and everybody else, this DSA chapter. I mean, you, you all have done an amazing job. If only colleges and universities were this organized and getting things done, <laughs> my life would be a lot better. Uh, and uh, so this has been absolutely outstanding in all ways, and uh, it's really wonderful. And, and I think, um, you know, more broadly, uh, DSA here and around the nation, I think, deserves a lot of credit uh, over the last couple of years for really bringing new ideas into the uh, political framework uh, that have desperately needed to be articulated and rethought and challenged for a very, very long time. And so hopefully we could talk a little bit about that tonight as well. But uh, I think that this is, these are exciting times. They're scary times. Uh, in many ways, they're awful times. Uh, but uh, they are times of opportunity. And uh, that kind of frames, I guess, why I uh, wrote this book. So, so basically, I'm not going to talk for too long here. I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes, I guess. Uh, and then we're going to have a lot of discussion. And so I'm going to move a little quickly um, and, uh, and really try to touch on as many points as I can, but understand that we won't be able to do too, too much in, in these 25 minutes. Um, so, you know, I, I think that when I uh, chose to wrote this, write this book, I mean, truth be told, it started before the 2016 election. Um, and uh, the 2016 election was a, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible, terrible thing in American history. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I mean Donald, Donald Trump is a scumbag, and, and, and this, but this is the reality, right? Why were we surprised that America would elect a racist misogynist as president, right? What, what, what country did we think we were living in? And, and, I, and so, I, and, but I think that, you know, so I was, I was already writing the book, but then when, when that happened, you know, it really did kind of uh, frame the way that I wanted to tell these stories, because I think that we have to understand, uh, we have to understand the reasons why unions have and have not been successful in the United States. And, and these are a lot of core questions that I think really affect a lot of us. Why is it that the United States does not have the more robust social welfare systems that they have in other uh, Western countries? Why is it that the United States does not have as long of a robust history of the left uh, and as, as powerful and as, stay, as much staying power as you see really all across the world? Why is the United States traditionally more conservative than other nations? And why is the union movement, first of all, located in so few states, and second, so relatively compromised uh, compared to other movements around the world. And I think that these, the answers to these questions help frame some of the larger problems in American society. Um, and, and, and so what I want to do is to just very briefly go over what I did in the book, talk about a couple of these points, talk about where we are today, and that's probably about all we're going to really have time for. So, 
thinking about the history of America in 10 strikes, and I fully admit I sort of cheated, you know, I mean, you know, it's a good conceit, uh, but I cheated a little bit, you know, about, about a third to a half of each chapter is about the, the strike itself, and then I provide, I think, the necessary context uh, and talk about a lot of other labor movements through, you know, in, in the rest of the chapters. And in each of these chapters, I really wanted to get across certain points, right? And so in the first chapter uh, on the Little Mill Girls, I wanted to make it very, very clear because so often, especially in the media, the idea of a worker, when it comes to your mind, it's a white male in a factory. And yes, that's obviously part of the American workforce, but it's only one part of the American workforce. Women have been erased from the labor movement and erased from our visions of work from the very beginning of industrial labor or really probably before that. And so by focusing on Lowell, not only do we show uh, you know, these early critical strikes, but we also show the centrality of women in the labor movement to begin with. And, and I think that that really came to the forefront, the necessity of that as well as the second chapter on the slave general strike uh, in the aftermath of the election when how many New York Times and Washington Post articles define the working class as a white man in Pennsylvania? You know, every single one. Do we need dozens of articles like, you know, interviewing somebody who voted Republican 11 straight elections about why they voted for Donald Trump? Like, this is not actually very helpful. Meanwhile, totally ignoring the incredibly diverse working class that is the actual American working class. That is male and it's female. It's, it's, it's gay and it's straight and it's trans and it's bi and it's Latino and it's, and it's African American and it's Asian and it's native and it's white. And yet almost all of that is erased by the media. No one's interested in what, you know, a Somali American in in Minnesota thinks about Donald Trump, well at least they, they, they weren't until the election, now they are, uh, and they're a little outraged by that actually. Um, so there we go, right? But, it's, but, but it, it's, it, it's outrageous. And so, you know, in, in that and then the second chapter on the slave general strike I think is really important. And the short version of this, and I'm borrowing from the great black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, who in his 1935 book Black Reconstruction notes that, you know, slaves freed themselves. And they freed themselves by an uncoordinated but massive general strike of simply walking away from the plantations any time they could. And in fact, now further historians have built on this, and they note that slaves did this in the American Revolution and the War of 1812 as well. They fled to British lines, and thousands freed themselves this way. But for the Civil War, it moves the conversation from Abraham Lincoln, who, let's face it, Abraham Lincoln was a great president, but he had to be pushed to do the right thing on this, because he was as racist as any white man in 1860, he had to be pushed to do the right thing, and the slaves themselves did that. And that's the most important labor action in American history, because so often when we talk about slavery in this country, we talk about it strictly as a racial phenomenon. And, oh, obviously it is, but it, the whole point of it is a labor system. The, um, this, the, the Americas, basically from New York to Argentina, was founded on forced labor. This is the point, right, is that white people, Europeans, will have people of color labor for them. Whether they're native or they're African, it didn't really matter that much to them. They wanted people of color to labor for them. And that is, and, 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 and the only real exception to that is New England, and of course all the New England money came off of the slave trade to begin with. So, so they're implicated as well. And, and, and so this is the foundation of not only the U.S. American economy, but the Latin American economy, the Caribbean economy. And, 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 and this was a labor system, and we have to understand it as such, because I think too often in economic questions um, and in racial questions, they, 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 they exist on parallel paths in our discourse, even on the left, and I think that's a problem, right? They need to be, they need to be deeply integrated. Everybody forgets that the March on Washington in 1963 was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. But nobody cares about the jobs and freedom because it doesn't go down to a soundbite that allows people, that allows Republicans to say that Martin Luther King would oppose affirmative action today because of, uh, because of, of two words he spoke in 1963. And moreover, that the March on Washington had a strong economic platform of, two, of a $2 an hour minimum wage, which in 2019 dollars is approximately $16 an hour. In other words, the fight for 15 goes back to 1963. But it has been forgotten about. It has been erased. Um, and, and, and so I think that these, these questions, bringing these issues to the forefront, is something that I really attempt to do throughout the book. Um, now, I don't want to go through every single of the 10 strikes. I mean, we can, we can talk about you know, individual ones 
uh, later. But, but you know, a couple of other major points but, uh, that, uh, that I think are critical, right? One is that, and, and, and I'll be curious, you know, this may be a little more controversial among this kind of crowd, um, but it is that there's very little evidence in American history that a, a union can succeed, or really a strike can succeed specifically, excuse me, if the state and corporations combine forces to crush it, which they like to do, right? Throughout American history, that is the main story. Workers bravely going out on strike, risking their lives, dying to build a better life for themselves, and the state and the military destroy it. And, and the employers, of course. And this is, the, the, and I think that, you know, that changes to some extent only with the New Deal. And we have to think about the New Deal in context of why it happens and, 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 and the things that workers did to make it happen, right? So I love FDR. I think FDR is great, F, but FDR is problematic, right? And Peter's talking about putting the Japanese in concentration camps. And yeah, that small problem there, right? Um, uh, you know, so his racial politics were frankly terrible. Um, in, in many ways. But in the overall scheme of American presidents, which, let's face it, if you try to rank American presidents, it gets pretty dry pretty fast in terms of good. It's like, all right, we're at number 10 and all these, all these people suck. So, you know, it, it makes it a little hard. But it also shows the reality of American politics. And I think the reality of American politics is something we have to deal with, right? Um, and, you know, and so, you know, I talk endlessly in the book about, you know, I mean, especially my students, so I don't really assign that my book is, I can't really assign my own book, I mean, it's pretty bogus, but I feel like a jerk, but, but uh, you know, obviously it makes up the lectures, and my students are like, oh, it's so depressing, like, more workers are dying, I'm like, well, you know, this is, this is, this is kind of what happens, um, but, you know, so we could talk about the Great Railroad Strike. We could talk about Pullman. Mostly we could talk about the states doing it, right? Because it was the states that really would do it through the militias and the National Guard, not to mention the Pinkertons and other private uh, thug forces and, and this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, chapter six of the book, I talk about Flint uh, to, to sum up the New Deal. And obviously there's many, many things you could talk about the New Deal. I mean, talk about Minneapolis, of course, right? Um, I think I did a radio show, and maybe it was in Minneapolis. They're like, why didn't you choose our strike? I'm sorry, there's a lot of strikes to choose from. But, but, but um, you know, when, when Roosevelt's elected in 1932, I mean, he doesn't have a very articulated platform. I mean, his basic platform is, hey, I'm not Herbert Hoover, which was pretty good, I mean, you know, given the alternative. <laughs> and, and, you know, it changes American politics. And so, you know, but he doesn't have a strong pro-labor agenda. I mean, he's okay with unions by and large, but he's not, he's not going to go out of his way. And then in 1933, the National Industrial Recovery Act's passed. And this is a complicated and pretty poorly written law the Supreme Court's going to throw out a couple years later, but it was already a disaster before this, that, that, that is a, a, an early attempt to deal with the economic problems. And they throw a clause in there without really thinking it through that seems to give workers the right to, to a union. And Roosevelt really wasn't prepared for what was about to happen, which is that in 1934, all, all these, you know, whatever Roosevelt thought was going to happen, workers had their own agenda of what was going to happen. They thought, well, Roosevelt wants us to have a union. So all across the country in 1934, workers go out on strike. In many ways, you could argue it's the most militant year in the history of American labor. The four big strikes that define the year are obviously here in Minneapolis. Well, sorry, not here. I don't want to insult anybody for St. Paul, but in Minneapolis. I know there's a sensitive, sensitive issues here. Uh, but, uh, but in Minneapolis with the Teamsters, in San Francisco with the longshoremen, in Toledo with the auto light workers, and then the huge textile strike in the South and, and in Rhode Island, uh, where, uh, where I live, where our awful governor used the National Guard to destroy it, and now the airport's named after him. So Rake is not the only strike breaker who has an airport named after him. But, uh, and, uh, you know, and this, but this redefines the conversation. And, and all of a sudden, a lot of people, because you know, Roosevelt has very liberal advisors, but he also has some really right-wing, awful advisors who are very pro-corporate. And they're, the whole administration, they're battling each other for, for control or for power. And Roosevelt's sort of playing the, 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 the unknowable middleman in all of this. And, uh, and, and, but, you know, what this does, this worker action itself, because it is so militant and so aggressive and causes such violence, it really makes a lot of people in power worried about revolution. And the response to that becomes the National Labor Relations Act. And which at the time was a revolution, well, I say revolutionary, but it was a, 
a pretty amazing law given the history of American labor because the history of American labor had been one of killing, right? of, of, of people getting killed constantly uh, and, 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 and in really awful situations. Uh, and and this, this changed it, right? Now, look, labor bar, the National Labor Relations Board is broken. The National Labor Relations Act is non-functional. You know, and, and, and this is all true. There are huge problems today. It doesn't work. Um, and this is what happens when you have a nation that has not had a comprehensive labor law bill passed in 81 years, right? That the last real pro-union bill that was a big transformational bill was the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, which creates the eight-hour day and the minimum wage and ends child labor and these sorts of things. You, you know, and, and, and ever since then, you know, especially since the, the, the late 50s, it started to get you know, roll back, but understand it was huge at the time and it creates the scenario that allows unions to succeed. So when you get to Flint, this has been passed, but it's kind of unknown what's going to happen as it gone before the Supreme Court. And the Flint workers engage in their amazing sit-down strike, right? And the sit-down strike is a brilliant strategy, very hard to pull off, it turns out, and, and the Supreme Court rules it illegal a few years later anyway, that's why you don't have it today. But the, uh, the, you know, what happens is that these workers at this General Motors plant in Flint decide to, instead of going out to strike, they stay in, which is critical because A, you can't send in scabs, which was a big concern, and B, if the military comes in, it's going to destroy the factory, right? So it, gives, it supposedly, hopefully, gives GM some, some um, um, you know, reason not to do that. But GM was not happy. And GM, in fact, was happy to have the military go in. And GM does what any company did in 1937. They go to the governor and they say, send in the National Guard and get those people out of there. And that is mostly the story of American labor history till 1937. But workers had elected the right politician. And I'm not talking about FDR. I mean, FDR is. But more importantly, they elected Frank Murphy governor. And Frank Murphy's not so well known today, although he was a Supreme Court justice after this. But Frank Murphy campaigned in 1934 for governor on a platform that he would not do anything to hurt unions. And he's under huge pressure when this happens. I mean, he gets panic attacks. He tended, that, he tended to, 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 to you know, have bad health when, when the stress was, was high and he was very, had very bad health at this moment. But he doesn't do it. And that's what's critical here, right? We talk about the militancy of the Flint workers. And yes, they were. They were amazing. But if they had not elected the right politician, a politician who would do what they wanted, who would support them when times got tough, both in the State House and in the White House, they would have been crushed. It would have been another story like this. And that is actually really, really important, right? And so, you know, one of the big questions, especially the leftists have, is how do you deal with a, the, 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 the reality of the American political system where you have, you know, one party that is becoming fully fascist and the other that's fairly pretty compromised, right? And I think that the story, you know, I think a part of the story is that it, you, you have to figure out how you you have to figure out how to negotiate this very difficult political system because it is the reality. As much as we would like to wish away this and wish that we had a multi-party you know democracy with five or six political parties that truly represented us, you know America's been around for over 200 years and that's never happened, right? And it probably isn't going to. So how do we as leftists, as socialists, manage this situation? How do we respond to the structural realities of the American political system? I'm not saying I'm a historian. I'm not a future prognosticator. I'm not saying it couldn't change. I am saying we have 200 years of evidence that suggests it's not going to, which is a lot of evidence. So that's something we have to deal with, right? So that's, so, and that's something I, I really try to push frequently in this, right? That you have to elect the right politicians Whatever, however you define that. Okay, so that's, that's one issue, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, and some of you may disagree with me, but that's okay. The second issue I really want to stress is it's very easy to write a book like this and just say, yeah, you know, solidarity, yeah, unions are awesome, but that's not, how helpful is that for us, right? I mean, if, if we're going to be honest about how to build a better union movement, don't we need to be honest about the labor movement's own failings? You know, and, and not just and not just and, and, and not just from a top-down perspective, but the failings of rank and file workers themselves. Why is it that rank and file workers make particular decisions? 
And the reality is, and this is also very important coming out of the, 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 the 2016 election. So many people, this question drives me crazy, actually. So many people say, why don't these workers, by which I mean white workers, why don't these white workers vote their interests? Well, why are we defining their, own, their only interests as economic interests, right? Um, you know, some of you may be familiar with uh, the, the concept of intersectionality that the great uh, lawyer and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw has come up to sort of, ex to sort of explain the, the different identities that make us up and that, and that mostly it's used to understand uh, issues of oppression. And I think it's, it's incredible, but I also think it actually is very useful to understand our oppressors. Right? That we're all made up of a very broad set of identities and we make choices based on which ones of these identities we prioritize. And look, the reality is, is that, the, is that um, large numbers, not all by any means, but large numbers of the, you know, when we ask this question, why aren't they voting their interests, they're voting their white interests because it means more to them to be white than it does to have class consciousness. And we cannot ignore that. Right? They're voting for their, their anti-abortion interests. They're voting for their misogynist interests. They're voting for whatever, or they might be voting for their class interests, right? People are complicated. But I think that we have to, you know, and, and we can say that, you know, and, and, and sometimes leftists like to say this, you know, to kind of explain this away. Well, you know, employers, and, and, you know, the capitalist system is deploying this and kind of bamboozling white workers into this. But look, white people are plenty happy to be racist on their own. They don't need their employers to help. To help. <laughs> yes, employers are going to take advantage of this. Of course they are. And they do over and over and over again. Right? But racial solidarity is something that white workers really struggle with. I mean, I just like to ask this question. This is kind of too big of an audience maybe for this, but with my students and other smaller things. But the first large-scale, meaningful piece of national legislation that comes out of the American labor movement is the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right? That was started, that came out of the Working Men's Party of California, that organized around this issue in the 1870s, and then it becomes national law in 1882. Because four California workers who envisioned their, their new place as a white man's paradise, other people were not welcome. And from the moment they get there in 1849, it is a maelstrom of violence against Chinese, against Native peoples, against Mexicans, but also against, you know, you know, for the French for that matter. I mean, it's, it's a very violent place. And this gets kind of personified in the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which, 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 which again comes, comes out of the California working class. And so you can't ignore these things, right? Um, and, and so I think this is something that I, I really want us to think about as well, right? Is that, you know, and especially coming out of the 2016 election, all these stories on endless, let's go to yet another diner in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, you know, the subtext of this is, you know, we have to, Democrats, you know, have to, you know, uh, have to reconnect with the working class. But why is the working class always white people, right? In every story, it's white people. Even when they're going to these towns that are, say, 50% African American, only people interviewed on in them are white. There's a very racist subtext to all of this. And I, I just feel like the actual American working class, as I stated, is incredibly diverse. And I think it's very, very important that the labor movement not repeat the mistakes of the past, the racist mistakes, the anti-immigrant anti mistakes that have done nothing but divide the working class, right? There's, it is a black hole for the, for the American labor movement to try to appeal to certain kinds of workers by demonizing other workers. That is just, that is the latest of Jay Gould saying he can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half of the working class. That's all it is. And so I think that uh, a truly anti-racist union movement has to be uh, in, in our priority as well as anti-sexist. Uh, you know, because, because you know, misogyny it, it at least as entrenched as racism, if not more so. And so this is something I think is, is, is really, really important. Now, luckily, I do feel like, you know, the labor movement has gone a long ways on this. Um, that, uh, you know, every institution in the United States is, is racist because it's the United States. And, you know, so yes, there are racists in labor unions. Yes, labor unions have not fully come to grips with their racist past or present. Neither is any other institution in this, United, in, in, in this country. So, you know, we don't forget about the labor. We don't throw the labor movement under the bus because of this. We try to make it better. And I think it is becoming better, right? I mean, I closed the book by talking about justice for janitors because, because as the last strike, because it's the first time, really, that a major national strike getting national attention was really centered on the, the quote, new immigrants, right? On the, the immigrants that have come to this country in such large numbers since the 1965 Immigration Act. 
And I think that's really, really, really important. And I think you know, today the labor movement is going a long ways in, if not officially repudiating that past, they've gone a long ways in, in making things better. And, and a lot of unions, not all, but a lot of unions are strong allies of the immigrant rights movement. And that is important, right? Because first of all, it's the future of unions. I it's one of the most simple Those are the work, that's the new working class. You don't organize them, you're dead. Right? And I think a lot of unions, not all, but a lot of unions are moving on that in the right direction on that. And so, and so I, I think that that issue is really important, too. Now, I'm going to, I have like three minutes left here, so I'm just going to close, and we'll talk about all this stuff, too, but I'm going to close by talking just a little bit about what's been going on the last couple of years, because, I, you know, I, I feel like, look, these are horrible times. I mean, the Supreme Court, and, and I think one thing that a lot of people have pointed out recently, this is very true, is that one problem the left has had is not taking the Supreme Court seriously enough over the last half a century, right? While conservatives, they are just like, dead focused on the Supreme Court from the top all the way down to the grassroots, you know, and, the, and you know, my family and stuff they started. But, but you know, that's all they care about because, you know, like my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, all they care about is Roe being overturned. Nothing else matters. So they'll vote for anybody, even Donald Trump, because that's all they care about. And I think we've taken them seriously enough, right? We, we, we haven't taken the, the legal system seriously enough. It's a lot. Anything we do, the current Supreme Court is going to overturn. I mean, Neil, you know, Kavanaugh is irrelevant here because Anthony Kennedy was as horrible on labor as any right-wing justice you could imagine. The real tell is Neil Gorsuch, right, who, who famously ruled when he, was a, uh, when he was on the appeals court, wrote an opinion, there was a, 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 a trucker who had a condition of employment that he couldn't leave his truck, and he gets stuck in a snowstorm, and it's either leave the truck or die, and he leaves the truck and he gets fired, and Gorsuch says that's fine. Right, he rules that's fine, and then jokes about it at a Republican gathering. Right? So it was hilarious that this choice was made. That's what we're dealing with. They're going to rule anything we do unconstitutional until we retake the Supreme Court or pack the Supreme Court or get rid of the Supreme Court or whatever we need to do. But we have to take that very seriously, right? They are going to overturn everything we do. But we can't let that stop us because it also delegitimizes what is already a pretty awful institution. And, uh, and, and we just have to work with it. We have to realize this is the reality. So these are bad times for the labor movement. But the teacher strikes have been quite amazing. And, 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 and I, think that, I think that it's telling that they come in both the reddest of states and the bluest, right? And look, a lot of these people are Trump folks, right? In Oklahoma, for instance, where is one of the most pro-Trump states, that, that after they won that strike, they then proceeded to vote out every Republican in the state legislature who voted against their pay raise except for one in the primary, which means that these teachers were Republicans, right, because they were voting in the Republican primaries. So they're not like the, the remnant Democrats in these, you know, the four Democrats in some county in western Oklahoma. Uh, you know, they're Republicans. But they're also in Los Angeles. They're also in, you know, Oakland tomorrow, right? Uh, and and I, think that, I think that what's, what's critical about this and the part of the reason they're so successful is the community-based strike. Because the reality is we all live in a very precarious economy. You know, 80% of us, 90% of us are one or two paychecks away from homelessness. Um, and uh, and, and it, 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 it's scary for everybody. And everybody knows this, right? Right now, we're in a moment in our history where, like in the, I think in the 1880s and 1890s, where you had been told these promises about capitalism, and all of a sudden, you've been slapped in the face, and you realize that you've been lied to for decades, and what do you do about it? And it took back, in the Gilded Age, 20 years to figure it out. And finally, socialism became a complex answer, instead of just taking out the Chinese, right? Socialism was a huge part of the answer, and it is today. And, 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 but I think that, you know, if you look at 2008 with the housing crisis, which is really where that slap in the face, I think, really happened, the left didn't do much, right? In the immediate aftermath, we were kind of short of ideas. We weren't organized. We didn't have the ability to mobilize people. Um, and so nothing happened, right? The, the bankers went scot-free. The same thing could happen again and probably will. But we spent the last decade figuring it out. We spent the last decade mobilizing. We spent the last decade, so this many people come out and listen to some, some jerk like me talk about socialism and, and unions. Like, that's amazing, you know? And that, you know, really starts with Occupy, uh, which for its, you know, had its failings, sure. But they were, they were figuring out from point A, how do you be a leftist again? And, you know, DSA's played a huge role in this. And, and I think that a big part of the reason is that everybody's frustrated. 
And part of the reason these teacher strikes are so successful is that everybody knows that they're fighting for themselves and for their child, or for their, for their students, your children, right? That, yeah, you know, they're fighting for a 5% pay raise, but that's so that they can, like, I don't know, sleep and grade the child's homework instead of working at Walmart. And that becomes a community-based thing, right? And, and, and it's been so much about the school, so this idea of, like, oh, greedy unions or whatever. And look, sometimes strikes are a bad idea. I do point this out where the demands are so far in front of the everyday experience of everyday people. It's part of the reason the air traffic controllers screwed themselves. Their demands were so far in front of the everyday person in the 1970s that people began to hate them. That's not the case now because the demands are our demands. And it's the same with... Sarah Nelson and the, I mean, and the Associated Flight Attendants that did so much to end that government shutdown along with the, the TSA workers, right? That by calling for that general strike and clearly beginning the process of moving toward it, notice how quickly it, 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 it happened. As soon as just a few people began to back off and not come in and they had to close down an airport terminal briefly, it ends. Because, look, Donald Trump doesn't care about you and doesn't care about me, but he sure cares about his buddies flying first class. Right? Those are the people he cares about, and boom, it's over, right, right, right there. That's a sign of this worker power, and everybody felt bad for these TSA workers, right, who are working. They're visible workers. They're working without pay. Nobody should have to work without pay. That is a moral outrage, right? And I, so I think we're at a point today. I don't know what's going to come. Again, the court is terrible. Republicans are going to be even worse people. We'll talk about Democrats in, in, in a bit and quite go into the detail on, I think, part of the reason why we think Democrats suck, and I could talk about that. But... And, and some of the reasons that they do, and, and I think it has to do with union failings in part, and we, we get into this, but we're also at a place of an unprecedented organizing in a smart way, in a way that matters, in a way that's building towards something, in a way that's electing the right people to Congress now, in a way that's challenging power, in a way that is not just like an outburst of anger that disappears, but in a structural way that begins to transform America, and boy, are they scared of you. And that's, and you can tell, every tweet by Ocasio-Cortez causing, you know, some, some conservative writer just flip out, right? The response to Representative Omar challenging that genocidal scumbag Elliot Abrams. And the fact that every, 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 I can't even tell us Elliot Abrams, what the worst people are now. They're scared of you, and that matters a lot, and we're moving in the right direction, so I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. All right, Eric, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Manira, I'm from the Racial Justice Branch, and I really want to hit on the topics you hit in the beginning, um, especially about um, just essentially black people. So I feel like what we're discussing is worker solidarity and the fact that it has kind of haunted the left for quite some time. Uh, the fact that constantly uh, people of color are kind of being sold by their white workers. Um, I kind of wanted to examine just for a moment the differences between capitalism and white supremacy and how people of color kind of have to deal with both of them. Uh, people often imagine uh, that they're related or conflate them often. Uh, but for example, for example uh, you can think of like a uh, Nike commercial supporting like Colin Kaepernick. Um, people like us can see the obvious contradictions in that, uh, but oftentimes um, workers have to deal with both capitalism and white supremacy, and how do they just uh, deal with that double burden? Should I answer that now? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's, all, yeah, that, that's an outstanding question, and um, you know, I don't know that I have a definitive answer to that, I, I think that, but that's such a great question, and I think that, that well, first of all, first of all, you're correct, right? They're, they're not the same thing. I mean, they, they, were, they sure worked in tandem, but they're not the same thing, and you, know, you have as much racism in a socialist country as you, as you have in a, in, a, in a capitalist country, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not as if uh, the Soviet Union, as it develops under Stalin, is exactly great to Jews, you know? I mean, it, it, there's, there could be, yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, you know, there, there can be plenty uh, of, of racism under socialism, and I think it's something that we have to be, it's something we have to be very conscious of. I think especially for white leftists, that, that you, you, you can't give credence or space for white supremacy to exist. Um, I think there's a lot of, and I think we see this actually right now, and, 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 and I mean, some people may not like what I'm about to say, but like, 
when, when Glenn Greenwald appears on Tucker Carlson's White Power Hour, which is what that show is, he is giving credence to white supremacy. When, when Michael Tracy writes for the Federalist, he's writing for a fascist publication. These are just not acceptable, right? That is not acceptable. You cannot appear, you cannot give credence to media that is intentionally denigrating the people of color just because you both hate the Democratic Party. You can't do that. And I think that the burdens of, of, of the, and, you know, I think that the burdens that, uh, well, I'm not going to, look, I'm not going to speak for people of color in, on the left. I mean, that's not my place. As a white leftist, I, uh, all I will say is that there is a lot of unexamined white supremacy. Um, I mean, one of the points I make on my blog that I write about, that I, that I write on, which is mostly a liberal blog, and I'm kind of the leftist on the blog, is that all white people are racist because it's not you're racist or you're not. It's a continuum. It's something that we're born with, or something that we're raised, or not born with, but something we're raised with, and you have to fight it. And it's a, you're never going to completely defeat it because it is the society in which we live. Boy, do these liberal commenters hate to hear that. Man, they get pissed off at me because, because I'm challenging the fact in many cases that they are sending their children to the good schools, which are the white schools. And they don't, boy, they don't like that at all. And, uh, and nothing makes them more angry than that. And, 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 and so I, I just think that we have to, as, a, as the white left, all working with uh, the, the left of, of the, the, working with people of color on the left, we have to be very conscious of our white supremacy. We have to constantly fight our white supremacy. We should be reading and studying issues of white supremacy all the time. We should be engaging in anti-racist workshops. We should be figuring out how we can do a better job. And we also need to shut up and listen, right? White dude, I mean, of course, I'm up here talking, but, you know, <laughs> like, well, white men like to talk, and we have to shut up and listen. And, and if we're being told, hey, you know, you're not actually really being supportive here, you, you're, you're, you're creating a double burden. Um, uh, you know, we, we have to take that seriously and not get defensive. So I don't know if that actually answers your question, um, but I just feel like mostly I should shut up and listen to you. Uh, so you talked about uh, a bit about like uh, unionism turning to this more like moderate uh, tone yeah. um, and kind of this is like uh, leading to a lot of like bad effects for especially for worker solidarity but you also stress that they should be in conjunction with government do you think that this kind of is a contradiction is that the more they are involved with government the more corrupt they get or the more uh, they are interested in politics of respectability and conservatism yeah, that, that, that's a great question. It's a balance. I mean, it, it, it's something that is not going to be perfect one way or the other. I mean, I, the way I think about politics is that there's a, there is an electoral politics and there's a, a politics that exists outside of elections. And that they both have to, they, they both have to work in tandem, not, not in terms of like, we all have to be thinking about elections all the time or there's like different different you know groups within a group that, that forget any of that but simply that people who say we should forget about the two-party system forget about electoral policy and just organize are not using their power as effectively as they could and people who say we you know all these like movements like Occupy Wall Street don't matter everybody should just register to vote or just wrong Right? I mean, yes, voting is important. Yes, yes, yes. But, 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 but it's not the only politics. It's the same with unions, right? That, yes, union, yeah, that, that's a risk, right? That once unions become integrated into the Democratic Party in the 1940s, that it becomes harder to stand up to that Democratic Party. That is true. There's no question about that. It didn't have to be the way it was. I mean, the biggest mistake, I think, that unions make is not so much being involved in the Democratic Party as it is stopping organizing in the 1950s, right? That once the famed Treaty of Detroit takes place where Ruther, Walter Ruther of the UAW and GM come to this five-year agreement that they give up on all the big social unionism stuff and just agree to the big wage gains and everything else, and they get fat and comfortable. That's, that's the bigger, I think that's the bigger error personally. Because it means that they give up organizing, they start showing, not every union, but too many start showing contempt for non-organized workers. They're not challenging power anymore. 
They're, and so once, and, 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 and it's rest on this idea of like a union, like a union company contract or compact, I guess more accurately, that's supposedly going to last forever. And then 30 years later, when you have first the air traffic controllers get crushed, and then Phelps Dodge in Arizona, and then the, the P9 plant here in Austin, and unions are like, uh, what do we do? And they have no answer. They don't even have the beginnings of an ability to figure out an answer. They don't know how to organize anymore. They don't know how to stand up for power. They don't, they don't, and, and they're, in the end, they're junior partners in a coalition becoming more junior every day as they lose members. So I think that in terms of the actual specific issue of unions and the Democratic Party, it's one that has been debated forever and will continue to be. And that's a worthy and very uh, good debate to have. And there's not a right answer, as you're pointing out. There are contradictions inherent in the, pro in the, in the question. Um, I think that there is plenty of, I think that you have to organize, you have to organize to, again, to elect Ocasio-Cortez, or elect Frank Murphy, or elect FDR, um, and to not elect Bill Clinton. But, you know, if we talk about why, we can talk about a little bit more on Clinton if you want to, but, but, but I, I, at the same time, I think that when unions simply become an adjunct of the Democratic Party, that that's a problem, right? And I think that um, in terms of the politics, that can matter too. You know, on, 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 the, on the, as anybody who reads my blog and stuff knows, on the national level, I, I think third parties are, are, are a waste of time, to be fair. I, there's so much organizing that goes into them, and then, you know, and you're not organizing around other issues, basically. But at the local level, that is not the same story. And if you're in a one-party state like Rhode Island, for instance, where I live, where being a Democrat means, quote, I want power, and you have those, the most horrible Democrats you could possibly imagine, I mean, just terrible, terrible, you know, I, terrible. It's like, it's like the mob, kind of literally, actually, because it's Rhode Island. But there's less crime in the mob. Um, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like, mob, a speaker of the house, a speaker of the house ended up in prison. It's, it's, anyway. But it's the worst possible human being. It's terrible people, right? That's a place where you could have, where you have like a 56 to 8 majority. You could have a, a, a party at the state level that, that would elect the right people. And I think there are models for that, like Working Families Party. Okay, it's not perfect, but, but they, they've done some good work in Rhode Island to elect some decent people, including working class people, DSA people, and this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, in Ohio, in Lorain County, Ohio, there was a union ticket that was put together to run against an awful Democratic Party ticket, and they won. So those kind of things, it's really about the structure that you're dealing with, right? So if you're in a situation like the cities here, where I assume, not knowing that much about politics here, that the Democratic Party wins everything, um, at least in the cities proper, then that's a different story, right? There always needs to be a challenging party. I think that's what's important. Whatever that might look like, there should be a challenging party, and unions can play a big role that out, in this case, opposing bad Democrats. So I think, I think there's, but I think a healthy argument's really the way to go. Get it. And um, along with like the disproportionate effects uh, felt um, in black labor organizing, there's also disproportionate, um, I guess, responses is what I would say. There are so many rebellions in your book that have been crushed violently, and I want to roll, um, just like examine the nature of a strike itself. What are your thoughts on strikes that go violent or strikes that have some kind of physical aspect to them. Um, one that comes to mind is like the Haymarket riots, uh, the uh, anarchists throwing the bomb um, into the police, things like that. Whether it be in self-defense or just as an act of aggression, what is the role of violence within strikes? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I if you're going to use violence, you'd better do it in conjunction with the workers you're going to affect. That's, that's what I would say. That, that, that in the end, you know, Alexander Berkman walking into the office of Henry Clay Frick after Homestead and somehow being unable to kill him despite having a knife and a gun. I mean, I mean at least know what you're doing, first of all. Anyway, and then Haymarket too, I mean, you know, that kind of violence is not, within, is not within the union movement, right? That kind of violence is just people deciding on their own to commit violence. And in both cases, it really undermines support for the workers. Now, that's a long time ago. I'm not going to sit here and 
other than making fun of Alexander Berkman, which is kind of a hobby of mine. But uh, 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 if you go to the, if you go to the, the, the Carnegie uh, Museum in Pittsburgh, they actually have the knife on the wall. It's very exciting. Uh, 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 you know, so it's sort of super pumped. But um, I, I think that the the problem, the biggest problem with violence, and I'm not, I'm not, I have no principled objection to it. It's just that it usually goes real bad. Right? Is it a good strategy? And I think that has to be dependent on an individual workers' movement making that call. But it's like, it's like my parents, to make a cheap anecdote as data. You know, my parents, my dad's like the only old white man from Idaho who's become a leftist in his old age. Instead of voting for Reagan, now he votes for Bernie. I really don't understand. What's, and it's not because of me. Let's, let's be very clear. <laughs> it was not because of me. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of watch this, but man, if he sees any rioting, whatever, it's not actual rioting. But he sees what is seen rioting on the media, man, he's like, why are those people doing that? That's wrong, that's property. You have to really organize a community around those kind of questions, right? You have to be cognizant that the aftermath of that is gonna be all hell breaking loose. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna do that, you gotta be prepared for the consequences and you'd better have, you'd be organizing your people to prepare for that and, and organizing your community that this is a possibility. So I, I have no, I'm not going to sit here and lecture about nonviolence because I, I think that that is, while I have no objection to nonviolence either, I, I think it's become a very, um, become a way to depoliticize confrontation. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that even if you look at the civil rights man, the great Charles Cobb book, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, I recommend it to everybody. Man, this is about black people with guns in their homes, including Martin Luther King, and they are not messing around. Right? And that's the actual people who are in the civil rights movement, you know? And, 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 and I think that a more realistic conversation about armed self-defense is, is certainly a conversation that we should be having. Absolutely, that should definitely be part of the conversation. Um, aggressive acts of violence, I think, is a different kind of thing. So I think it depends on what kind of violence we're talking about. I think that's a really complicated question, and it's, and, but it, it is, not a bad thing that it is something that we are talking about seriously for the first time in a long, long, long time because, it's, because these are ideas that actually need to be debated and not just, not just swept under the rug as like, oh, you're crazy for saying this stuff, but it's actually a conversation that we should be having. So I'm glad you brought that up. All right, I'll pass it on to my... Okay. Hello. Um, so I'm Diana. I, I'm representing the Socialist Feminist Branch of the, um, the DSA. And um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to um, talk about a, a few of my impressions real quick um, of the book. So, well, first of all, like on a gen in a general sense, um, I, I I really enjoyed it because I was um, because like pretty much all this information was new to me, right? Like you know they don't teach this stuff in schools. Like I've been saying to people, like um, this is the it's it's the sort of book that I would have liked to to read in schools if schools like gave a shit about labor history at all. Um, and because, um, like, I feel like all you know, all we really learned was um, you know there was a uh, like a paragraph about the the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and then like there's you know the the Luddites in in England and so on, and that's you know basically it. Um, and um, so I um, I think, but then from from a um, reading from a, a feminist perspective as well, um, some interesting things that uh, that some themes that I kind of uh, one thing that I, I saw as I was reading um, was and like not that this is you know as a leftist not that this was a surprise to me or anything, um, but like obviously you know um, throughout history there has not been a lot of um, a lot of consistent. Um, Solidarity of, of white women with women of color in um, like throughout you know any of the any of the the women led movements, um, but I uh, and so like that wasn't a surprise. But then what did stand out um, in especially stark contrast to that was um, the way in which uh, white women were often um, nevertheless willing to um, willing to show solidarity across class lines. Um, and like there was, so like, um, for example, uh, like in the, the, the chapter that where you um, talked about the progressive movement and like how they, um, like how, uh, how wealthy white women suddenly, you know, suddenly started realizing, oh, this, like, 
um, we have opportunities to to support work, working class women and um, and uh, you know they, and they they help get the stories out and they they help support um, poor women and um, like. <laughs> Uh, and um, and then you know and then of course we've seen that through the present like when um, you know when it comes to um, to things like uh, to things like um, like the Equal Pay Act and Roe v. Wade and so on you know like those um, those are like those are are movements that um, that women across classes uh, uh, you know again white women um, women across classes are happy to to support each other on um, but then also. Uh, one place where where I thought that was especially interesting was um, in the case of the of the the Lowell Mill girls, uh, and how <laughs> um, because the uh, because those women in particular, so like if um, if you're not familiar with the with what happened there, the um, so a lot of these women who were working in the mills were um, were actually not uh, not like working class by birth; they were middle class or they were privileged. And um, they were taking these jobs in the mills as kind of like a kind of like a like kind of a summer job sort of a gig, like um, you know, uh, kind of just like for some for uh, for some spending money, like while they, I guess, yeah, waited to get married exactly. <laughs> so um, and so like they so they didn't really so you know they they weren't um, they weren't raised in. Um, in a world where they always knew that they needed to have jobs, and yet um, they they got these like these working class jobs, and um, then when they were, um, and then when they were like they they faced um, oppression as workers, they suddenly you know realized hey like this is you know this is messed up like we got we got to change this, and so it was really interesting how like they they had the option in theory of just like. Um, I'm just saying, nope, I'm not, I'm not dealing with these long hours and these dangerous conditions anymore. I'm just going home. They could have done that, but instead what they did was they banded together and organized and agitated for, um, for improved working conditions. And um, so, <laughs> and one thing that you mentioned, like that, uh, that part of the, the reason that they were able to do that is because they were already expecting, um, they, like they expected better for themselves. Like, they expected to be treated better, and suddenly, hey, you know what? We're not we're not being treated well. Um, so, uh, so I'm, <laughs> I don't know that I have a, a question exactly related to that. Um, <laughs> just that it was it was something that stood out to me as um, as a yeah. an interesting theme. Well, let me actually. I think there's a couple of things that are definitely to talk about. I mean, one, one, well, thank you for the, the compliment on the book. And I, I think that part of what I wanted to do here is like people, so I, I, so I, I decided at the beginning of last year to try something. So Twitter is objectively the worst technology in human history. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's a steward. Plus, just on top of it, if there's no Twitter, Donald Trump's not president. I mean, some other horrible person might be, but still, like, he's not president. So right there, automatically worst technology in human history. But. But at the same time, like, there's obviously very active left on Twitter. And I decided, so I, so I, I built these, I built these, uh, 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 these, th this book, um, because I've been writing on the internet for so long, it's, it, it, it becomes both that and my first book um, about, uh, about outsourcing and capital mobility and uh, the, the need to create international labor standards. I'd read about it so much I was able to kind of compile, or compile stuff from the book, which was or from the blog, which was kind of awesome because it I mean I wasn't really doing that much work, and and so that 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 that, that was good. But you know I started doing these tweet storms, and some of you may have seen them about these labor history dates, and, and I didn't know what would happen. Man, people love it. I mean, way more than I would have thought. I mean, and and there still really is a demand to understand labor history. As well as, and, and, and not just labor history, I think that if people were doing this with black history, if people are doing this with feminist history, with gay history, I think people want to eat that up there. Everybody knows that there's these movements out there. We don't know anything about them, right? Unless you're a nerd like me who spends his whole life reading this stuff, right? And so, and so there is this pent up demand, and it's been an interesting way to like actually teach this on Twitter and, and, and to present this information. And the book is intended to do the same thing. Uh, in a very digestible way, I mean, my goal, when I write something, uh, you know, I don't have any interest in none of this fancy academic talk. Um, 
And my dad did not go to college. He worked at a plywood mill, anti-union for that matter. We, so we, we had some fights. And, uh, and, and, but if he can't understand what I'm writing, then I'm doing it wrong. That's my view on it. And there's a place for theory and all this other stuff if you're into it. But that's my goal is I want to be able to provide you this material in a digestible way. So hopefully, the, this, and the Twitter thing is kind of when we do that too. So I, I, hopefully, hopefully I succeed in that. But on, on the issues of, of, of both men and women and the, 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 the issues of like wealthy white women and poor white women, because you certainly right about the lack of, as we all know from the history of the feminist movement, the lack of racial solidarity is, is I mean, pretty central to the history of feminism. Um, you know, going all the way back to women's suffrage, of course. But, uh, but that, A, that y you're right. I mean, I mean I, so I was writing a new labor history post that's going up tomorrow about the Lynn, Massachusetts shoe worker strike in 1860, right? And it's not a strike too many people are familiar with unless you read a lot of labor history, but say these conditions sucked. And they go on strike. It's the biggest, it's the biggest strike before the Civil War. But the reason I bring it up is because the men would not, even though like five-sixths of the workers are women, the men would not advocate for a higher wage for the women, even if it's their own wives and daughters, because they didn't think they'd be taken seriously if they did. And so the women are organizing separately and actually take what they can get and leave the strike, which and then ends up kind of leaving the men high and dry. But again, like, cr not only is cross-racial solidarity difficult, but cross-gender solidarity is very difficult. Uh, and, and this is just one of so many examples. And the thing about, the other thing about like the progressive women, upper, middle or upper class liberal women who get involved in something. That's happened in the progressive era frequently and sometimes does today too. I think that it's a good object, it's a good object lesson I think to bring this up because I, I think especially on Twitter, which again, so often anytime some liberal says something that the left's known for a long time, there's like, oh, you know, it's just like all this ragging on people and saying like, oh, yeah, you know, neoliberal. Oh, yeah, you know, making fun of them. Don't do that. Just take your allies where you can get them, right? You're, and, 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 and liberals are your, liberals are kind of allies, right? The point is you can organize them. Don't make fun of them. Organize them, yeah. right? <laughs> liberals are, uh, liberals have potential. Like, people, people talk about like indivisible, right? And left, people on the left make fun of it. I spent last spring, winter and spring, in a town of 6,000 people in rural western Pennsylvania. I should have been required to file like 13 New York Times articles on random people. <laughs> and, like, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's a grim place, okay? It is opioids, the whole deal. And my wife, now mercifully, we teach at the same school, but she was teaching at this school, and, and I spent a lot of time out there. And like, people are so isolated out there. It's a 72% Trump dis, uh, county, right? People are so, so isolated. And something like Indivisible became a place for these liberal women to actually feel community and begin to organize around anything. So yeah, we could say it's not as woke or whatever as we want, but that's just being snobs. Like we're not gonna win if we can't organize people, and we're not gonna organize people by being assholes to them, yep. right? You gotta organize them by bringing them in and, ma and making their politics better than they are. Mm -hmm. That's how you actually organize people, not by like, I'm gonna get some Rad Twitter followers by 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 being snarky. Like I like snark too, but it's not an organizing tool, yep. in my view. So 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 that's how I feel about it. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned Twitter, and so when I was reading the book, I um, I live tweeted a bit of um, like interesting facts that I saw in there and um, in the book, and uh, one of them. So and um, I got I did get some some good engagement from friends who are you know. Um, who are, are not in DSA and, and um, on things that they found especially interesting that I found especially interesting, like for example, um, like the anecdote about the um, about the Rosie the Riveter poster that was that was actually um, uh, like you know so the 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 one that that everybody knows about where Rosie's going like you know like that. Um, <laughs> So apparently that was actually created by um, by Westinghouse as like an an intern what is it internal it's basically an anti-union like, post yeah and so yeah so the we can we can do it apparently refers it's Westinghouse, to Westinghouse not women yeah it's Westinghouse. Westinghouse without unions yeah without unions yeah. yeah yeah not and not like not women it's not we can do it does not mean women um, but like um, so I posted about that obviously I you know I most of my followers are um, consider themselves feminists and. 
nobody, you know, nobody knows that. Um, and I, I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter. I mean, people can. I mean, I when, yeah, when I say that, I want like, 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 you know, so many women have like have tattoos, and I don't want them like covering up right. the tattoos or, or whatever. You know, I mean, I mean, you can you can appropriate images any way you want to, yeah, but it's just, the other. But, but you know, so yeah, yeah. I don't. I always, I always feel like when I, when I talk about that, yeah, I, I want to, I want to, I want to like promote that. But I also don't want to make people feel bad. It's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like a balance, you know. Well, you know, there's there's always the the Norman Rockwell image, yeah, the superior Rosie. Um, <laughs> so um, I wanted to move on to a couple of of questions I had. So um, first of all, you you did touch on the um, on the gay rights movement of the '70s and onward, and um, so it, uh, the section of the book on that was pretty small. It was only like a page. Yeah. Um, and so I was, um, I was wondering if you could expand on that at all, um, especially since, um, since there wasn't really any, there, there really wasn't any mention of, uh, of discrimination that people faced within their unions. Yeah. Um, and um, I thought, well, surely that cannot, you know, surely there was not none. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the book to really read about that is, is Miriam Frank's Out in the Union. And that's a book everybody should read. I mean, she really goes into that in a lot of detail. Um, the reality is we don't have a huge um, literature on that, which is really, I mean, when you write a book like this, to a certain extent, you're, being, you're reflecting what you know and what, what, what's being written out there. Um, that, that, that is a topic that's growing, certainly. I mean, the amount of gay history that's being written right now is gargantuan. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we're in a moment where, uh, it's a more broad point, but like every, everybody reads Howard Zinn. Of course, look, Howard Zinn was wonderful, you know, I emailed him once. He was like super kind and emailed me back in like five minutes. It was amazing. And I was like, what? Yeah, well, how do you have time for me? Obviously a wonderful man. But you know, people's history of the United States is 40 years old. And like, you know, all of the things that he said historians should do, like we've done them. Like, is there all, you want to read African American history? <laughs> Enjoy the 30,000 books out there about it. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But, it, but the, it's not necessarily getting sort of brought into the public, right? And, and I think this is something to, to, to kind of think about. Maybe we need a newer kind of a, an updated version of, of that, a new kind of people's history is something to think about. But, but I, I think in terms, and, and, and so something like, 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 like queer history is growing by leaps and bounds now. I mean, you just in the last five years, it's like huge. So five years from now, if you wrote this book, it would probably be different. The truth is there's a ton of discrimination in unions if you're queer, right? I mean, absolutely. It, and, and there becomes in the 70s, especially with the rise of the gay rights movement, uh, you know, queer caucuses in unions. I mean, it's a moment where, you know, it's a moment where uh, the rights movements uh, throughout America are manifesting themselves in, in the labor movement. So it's really the same moment that you're seeing the Coalition of Labor Union Women that gets formed in 1974 you know, black power in unions, and, and all of this is, 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 is happening. Um, and so the answer is that, yes, there is a ton of discrimination of queer workers in unions on the shop floor, within internationals, within locals, uh, that, you, you know, union uh, hierarchies are not taking it seriously. Uh, they're laughing about it. It's, just, it's, it's like racism. It's the same thing. Unions can be homophobic, too. Right? If, 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 and and if, if American society as a whole is homophobic, so are unions going to be. But, there, but as we are now beginning to discover as these histories come out, you know, there's also a, a greater and greater history of people fighting back. You know? And I think, that, I think that in a few years we'll know a whole lot more, and I think it would actually be very interesting also to push that, that, that discussion back. You know, to, like, you know, we know that in the 1920s, for instance, uh, in New York, there were huge gay balls that like 10,000 pe people come out to, and they're not all, they're not all gay. And, and that, you know, there is probably a lot more, uh, a lot more, um, you know, uh, gay history within the labor movement uh, than we think that there is, um, and that we're going to find out a whole lot more about that. So yeah, I, I think that is, I think that's a, a perfectly legitimate criticism uh, of, of the book. There's not enough in there about that, um, and, uh, uh, but if I was to write it five years from now, I bet there would be like a lot more. I have to kind of wonder like how, um, how much of that, uh, how much of the history that we've lost was informed by, um, by AIDS in the 80s, um, since I know that a lot of, uh, you know, I know that like um, that among um, queer people, like there's you know um, uh, there's a lot there's a sense that like entire that an entire generation was lost, right. um, and uh, and that you know ever since it's been kind of a um, kind of rebuilding from the ground up, and so you know you kind of have to wonder like how much of uh, how much of that was 
was labor his history that was lost, you know. Um, but anyway, um, I, I just wanted to, to ask, so, um, so you talk about, obviously, like about, a lot about the, um, the legality of, of organized labor, um, how, you know, how it was treated by, uh, by, you know, by the courts, by the government, um, and as well, like the legalities of the, the tactics that people used, um, and, you know, and, and also the, um, I guess, the, the reactions that people had to, to tactics that were, you know, that were clearly not legal, you know, to violent tactics and so on. Um, but I was wondering um, if you had thoughts uh, on, um, on the effect of, of, uh, of I guess, um, the law when, uh, in cases where, where the labor itself is of questionable um, legality. So like, for example, I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of like sex workers organizing. Um, since of course, like sex workers have to like, you know, are either, um, like either their work is itself illegal or it's extremely heavily regulated. Um, and I mean, I guess I suppose like obviously it would have a, have a chilling effect, but um, if you had any thoughts on, on like how it, um, on how it uh, changes the, on how it changes the, the movements. Well, I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's much more difficult to organize um, when your work is illegal. But I, I think that, um, you know, I think that legality is something that is not, it's, 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 it's obviously very important, but it's not really defining as to what's work and what's not. And, and I, I kind of go back to the slave general strike where, you know, uh, these are workers that are, you know, not considered human almost. And yet, outside of that, they're able to organize themselves and create enormous change. And I think you think about sex workers, it, it's to some extent it's the same. I mean, I think that if we say, you know, if, if, if anybody who says that sex work is not labor is pretty wrong. I mean, you know, I mean, and I think this is important on an international scale too. Look, if you, you know, and, and, and I think that, um, you, 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 you know, I, it's going to be a little dirt dishing here, but I have this colleague in a different department. And she's all into, like, white women need to go to Vietnam and Cambodia and save these brown women from sex work. And she gets all this funding from, like, evangelical groups and stuff, and it's kind of, it's kind of eye-rolling. And what she's not talking about is that if you, if you really don't want sex work to be the option, like, you provide them better jobs, right? You give them power. You know, you give women power to make an economic decision for themselves, right? Because it's not as if sex work is, I mean, it, the, the amount of sex work in American history is severely underrated in terms of public knowledge. Like, you know, our cities were just a giant brothel pretty much from like 1776 until 1915. I mean, if you, there are maps of these, these, these histories that have come out of like Manhattan and where the brothels were. And it's like every block is a brothel. Seriously, in, in some areas, and 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 it's a huge part of our of of, women, of the of I mean men's work too to some extent yes, but of women's work throughout most of American history, and it is a actually critical part of thinking about women as workers and their history. Sex work is at the absolute center of that, um, and so fighting to make sex work legal and safe is part of the fight for labor rights. And they can't be separated, right? If, if you, I think that it's, it's hard to make an argument that if you don't support a, a, safe, and, a safe and healthy workplace for sex workers, you're, you, I mean, you're, you're engaging in an anti-solidarity action, you know? Because these are workers, and whether it's economic or whatever reason they're choosing to be sex workers, they deserve the same kind of safe workplaces that everybody else deserves. And of course, they don't have them. Um, because of this legality. So the legality is critical, but I think the legality is something we need to be fighting for, right? That, that they should be legal. Um, and then that would make things a whole lot better. So, yeah. Thanks. This is a really great conversation so far. I'm enjoying all of it. Excuse me for pulling on my phone, because I do want to read one question that came from Dave Camper, our uh, Labor Branch panel member who couldn't be here today. So, just a second. Sorry, I had it pulled up and then I lost it, but it's, here it is. Okay. Um, 
So Dave says, um, your book talks a lot about how racism and sexism divided workers, but you mostly focus on the private sector. And he wonders if you think there's anything different about public sector work that might ameliorate or exacerbate those divisions. In particular, many people in communities of color have noted that a side effect of seniority-based civil service and tenure rules has been that people of color are often denied access to public sector jobs. Um, is this different than the private sector, or do you think it's just a variant on the same theme? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The, I mean, first of all, you know, in, 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 I mean, you know, the history of black unionism is actually very much the history of public sector unionism. Um, that, you know, especially the postal service was an area where black workers had uh, jobs that they, you know, were among the best jobs African Americans could get for a very, very, very long time. Um, and so there's actually a really long history of black workers in um, in the uh, public sector uh, having uh, some pretty decent jobs. Um, the I don't know that the public sector. I mean, you know, seniority. It's, it's tricky, right? Seniority is a central tenet of unionism. And nobody's been able to come up with a better version of how you hire and fire than seniority. At the same time, seniority can be very racist. Mm -hmm. So there is that. And that, and that, you know, as you have desegregation mandates, in, and this is one of the ways that working class has been divided, uh, but in, really especially in the private sector, uh, is uh, things like, you know, in construction-based unions when uh, in the 60s and 70s they're forced to desegregate and that, mean, that means a challenge to the seniority system. And that's a problem. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, that, uh, I think that is a problem. And I don't know, the problem, the, the problem with dealing with the problem <laughs> is that no one's come up with a better solution than seniority. And this is something that is deeply divisive. And it's one of these areas in which, in which white privilege gets very hesitant to be challenged. And that you have otherwise often very good meaning white unionists revolt over this attack on seniority because then it's not only an attack on themselves or their racial uh, 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 values, but they see it as an attack on unions, the unions themselves. So that is a very, very, very tricky issue. Uh, but it's also one that, you know, I mean, you know, uh, until there's equity uh, in the economy and society, it's one that we have to face head on. Um, so I don't think I have a full-fledged uh, answer to that, except to say that uh, that seniority issue, both public and private sector, is, is, is critical, difficult, and uh, uh, leads to some very, very unpleasant conversations. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we do have a mic for uh, audience members to use as you ask your questions, and we ask that you use that both so everybody here can hear you, but also for the sake of the live stream that we're doing. Um, Amy, do you have that? Yeah, I've got it. Oh, you've, oh okay. Anne's got it. Um, so uh, do you, you want to just like float around as people have questions? Okay, perfect. So if you have a question for Eric, go ahead and raise your hand. that the legislature is an inherently political thing. Like our existence is political and trying to get our members to engage in that and fight with it and fight for ourselves. Um, but really I wanted to touch on, because um, it branches off of the racism and the, the classism and stuff, but we see a lot of ageism too. Um, because, you know, we're starting to see, like I see a lot of baby boomers and a lot of millennials in my job. Like we have a hard time recruiting mid-career and it's because of the seniority thing we don't have built-in mechanisms to negotiate if you're new to state employment you start at the bottom period in a sentence so there's a lot of institutionalized things that have worked in the past that are not working for us now um but i, I just wanted to hear you speak about breaking down that f you i got mine <laughs> um, kind of mentality um i actually was on the task force to get paid parental leave for all of the employees and we got a huge pushback from the older employees well don't forget about us don't forget about the pensions and like i fought for pension funding just as hard as you did
Um, if you want people to be around to pay into your pension when you're retired, you need yeah. to recruit people like me. Um, so, <laughs> so I think it's all related that it's a white supremacy thing, it's an age thing, it's a class thing, you know, but um, specifically in that FU I Got Mine attitude, like how do we start breaking that down um, and talking to our own because I've gotten into arguments where I was told it was a six week paid vacation um, and I didn't get that, why should, and also to, um, that it's a, if we ask for this, we're gonna have to give something else up. And we didn't have to, we showed the business case, it was a, a good thing. Um, so how we change the narrative of showing business case for us as labor and breaking down that um, if you I got mine or we have to give something up to get something new. You know, the first thing that makes me think of is not actually an answer to your question, but a side point that I often make, which is that what the complexity of that reality shows is that anybody who says they have a simple answer to fix labor's problems is full of it, <laughs> right? It does not, I mean, and so many people will, 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 will kind of put it, like, union should do this. Well, maybe, right? But the reality on the ground is really, really complicated in that way. And everybody who works for a union, uh, anybody who is an active union member in their local knows this. And people are complicated. I mean, so I don't necessarily have an answer for you. It's universal. I mean, you know, I, I'm a union member. I'm on our executive committee as a faculty union, the worst people to organize of all time. <laughs> Nobody shuts up. Oh, my God. Ugh. You know, everybody, everybody's a special snowflake. Solidarity is an unknown. Like, oh, my God, it's, it's difficult. So we're working on it. We're working on it. And I think that's all you, I mean, I think that's all you can do, right, is that, I mean, we're in the same boat. It's like, you know, we advocate for the lowest paid members of, especially in a, in a world where so many faculty members are contingent and the full professors who are pulling in six figures get mad at us because what about X? You know, why do we fight for that? And, you know, a, fr a friend of mine finally said, he, who was negotiating the contract in the meeting over this, this senior professor was so angry. He's like, well, you know, if, if you want to give me your salary, like, I, I, I will, you know, you know it, it, was, it was just, it was just a, this expression of privilege. And I think there's a lot of that. It's reflective of a larger political problems. It's reflective of people voting against, you know, t taxes for schools and things like that because oh, I don't have children, you know, or my children are gone. How is this going to affect me? So I, I think that... I mean, this is something of a pat answer, but if I actually had a full answer for you, I'd probably, A, would be wrong, and B, would be, you know, would be, like, if it was the right answer, I'd be very well-paid union, like, president or something. Um, I think you just have to, I think it is a multi-year process of building a culture of solidarity in a union, right? Internal organizing in a union. I think that's something that is often too often not talked about, right? That we talk about organizing, and we talk about getting new members, and this stuff is all absolutely critical, especially in an era where we're just getting punched in the face left and right by government, and by employers, and by, all, and by these structural changes, and by the courts. But there's not enough internal organizing that goes on. There's not enough attention paid to newsletters. Um, I, as a historian, I love a good union newsletter because it's how I make, it's how I, it's how I make my, like, when I'm doing real research, like, the, the, the nitty-gritty stuff, it's what I'm using, right? To get at what a union's doing. And meanwhile, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a member, because i kind of a emeritus member of a union that, of a large union, we'll, we'll go in name today, that you all probably heard of, that sends in a newsletter, and it was a newsletter that was nothing but four pages of like a list of contract victories over the last two years. I'm like, this is not, this is nothing, right? You're not educating your members. So I think that there's a lack of internal organizing, a lack of solidi solidarity building on, on the shop floor on a day-to-day -day basis, a lack of education, a lack of, of political organizing. And I understand all that stuff takes time and, and, and money and patience and, and uh, once again time for people who are already super busy and super engaged and how much time can you really give? You know, am I not supposed to sleep? Am I not supposed to see my kids? I get all of it. But I think that that, I think that long-term internal organizing has to be the answer that, uh, that, you know, because too often we're dividing ourselves within the unions and not understanding that fighting for uh, one person this time means that I'm going to be the person who's going to gain next time, and I'm gaining anyway. So, I mean, you know, again, like, I, I think that's the best answer I can give you on that. Diet and exercise. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know.
Right. So um, recently I was reading an article that was discussing Amazon's decision to drop their New York headquarters as a capital strike. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could sort of talk for a bit about how working class people can prepare themselves for situations of capital strike, because that does seem to be like um, a trend that is going to just only continue as we become more powerful and more effective. I mean, I would say that we've been seeing a capital strike ever since ever since 1965 or even earlier. I mean that that you know from the you know that 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 from the moment that uh, radical socialist immigrants organized the textile mills of New York and Massachusetts and Rhode Island, that those uh, that capital struck a move to Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia. That as soon as as soon as unions successfully organized in Tennessee, North Carolina and Georgia, they pulled up stakes and moved to Mexico, Guatemala, and Bangladesh. Uh, that what Amazon's doing here is actually, I, I would argue, not a, uh, a, anything particularly unique, uh, but doing what corporations have been empowered to do for a very, very long time, and openly encouraged by the federal government to do in many, many cases. Um, I mean, you know that if you want to, you know, I mean, when we're talking about capital mobility, um, you, you know, we're talking here about the failure of Operation Dixie to organize the South and to organize, and, 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 the, and you want to talk about the, the way race divides the working class, that's why, that's basically why you don't have unions in the South, that's why Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton come to power with owing unions nothing, and that's why they treat unions like garbage, because they don't owe unions anything. They never have owed unions anything because racism got in the way and, and, and attempts to organize Arkansas and Georgia failed, right, and they remain largely non-union states today. And, uh, and so, and then, you, you know, you have the border industrialization program in Mexico in 1965, which is a cross, you know, U.S. and Mexican government uh, plan to pull American corporations into Mexico. And look, Mexican people need jobs as well. And, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Mexico, and I believe very solidly in, in international labor solidarity uh, with the Mexican working class. Um, but uh, their, you know, their government treats them terribly, and, you know, their unions are, are corrupted by that, by that government. And then NAFTA is another example of this, right? I mean, NAFTA just codifies what was already going on, but NAFTA is a gigantic capital strike encouraging people to move across the rope, or move first to Mexico. Uh, and then, oh, or, and look, in some cases, I mean, my, my dad, the timber mill worker, lost his job uh, because of uh, NAFTA because of cheap Canadian timber, right? So, it, you know, it, it's not, it, it, can go, it can go different ways. And so I would say that, uh, and, and then the capital strike that allows Nike and Walmart specifically to uh, move their operations and subcontract uh, production to Bangladesh, where a few years ago at the Rana Plaza, 1,138 workers die making Walmart clothing because the factory collapses and Walmart does nothing and has no legal consequences as a capital strike as well. So I think that we need to look at what Amazon is doing, not as something new, but as something that's been going on for a long time. I mean, until we, and, and, you know, I mean, what part of the goals that we have to have, I think, is, well, let me put it this way. We're at a moment right now where socialism is coming back but the socialism coming back needs to make a lot more radical demands, I think, than a lot of the socialism that's, that's, that's actually happening right now. And I'm not saying that in any way critical of the ideas that are coming out. We're rebuilding a movement from basically nothing. And uh, we are moving in incredibly positive directions. But I think some of the things that we have to do is say that basically corporations can't move unless they have a really damn good reason to. And, that, uh, and if they do move, then the, the, the labor and environmental laws that we decide that our nation should have follows them wherever they go. And that we open up the American courts to do that. And uh, this is something I feel very passionate about. I've, had, I, I, I've written, my first book was kind of about this. I have some articles in, in Dissent and uh, the Boston Review. Uh, exploring the uh, legal framework around this kind of decision. And so for me, what Amazon's doing is just every, what every corporation's been doing for uh, almost 100 years now. So they're, they're all evil, basically. So. <laughs> there were a couple of hands in the back, Well, I mean, I don't think I'm in a position to speak explicitly to the Federal Reserve's explicit role. I, I think that, um, 
I think that, it, once again, it's something that we need to think very broadly on. Um, I uh, advocate that a job is a human right, that everybody should have access to a job if they want one, uh, that, uh, that uh, it should be a federal guarantee. And note this is not that radical. Um, in, 19, in, in 1978, we nearly got that with the Humphrey Hawkins, the original Humphrey Hawkins Act, where uh, you, in the, original, um, in the original writing of that bill, um, which, which was actually a very cross-racial attempt to build, labor, to build labor solidarity across classes by, I mean, across races by, by, um, uh, by uh, integrating black power demands uh, and brown power demands into, into a labor bill for economic opportunity uh, in the inner cities that did not exist in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, Hubert Humphrey uh, was uh, on this, as well as Augustus Hawkins, who's one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus and represented South Central Los Angeles. And in the original bill, it was actually not only did you have the right to a job, but if you could not find a job and the, go and the government didn't provide you a job, you could actually sue the federal government for a job. What a good idea. And, that, and, then, and, then, car and then, first of all, first of all, the unions themselves forced them to take out that sue the government part because they wanted to advocate for their members primarily. So this is one area where the union movement it makes a big error. Um, and then the Carter administration just eviscerates it. So it technically passes, but it's a shell that is really, Humphrey had died in the meantime. That's kind of a cheap, kind of a cheap, um, uh, kind of a cheap uh, uh, a tribute, I guess, to Humphrey is the only reason it passes in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so I, I think that in terms of, I don't really know exactly the role of, of the Federal Reserve specifically, but I think that the way to get around these sorts of issues is to advocate for the right for a job. That is a human right uh, and, uh, and, uh, that, and, and, and that job can be any number of things. It doesn't have to be like digging, di you know, like, like, you know, digging ditches and then refilling them as make work kind of things. But there's nothing wrong with make work either, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 you know these things are okay. That is a lot of what happened in the New Deal. And uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do uh, to uh, 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 desperate things that we could do in our society we desperately need. So, so, so that would be my broader thing. I think rather than I, 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 would, I would focus on the big picture on, on a personal level. of interest in worker organizing on the part of progressives uh, in the time of the progressive yeah. movement. You talk a little bit about that and, and whether uh, we're going to face a similar challenge or are facing a similar challenge uh, today. Is that a little bit about liberals? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, I, I, yeah, a lot of them are uncomfortable with it today. I mean, I mean, you know, in, in the in the 1910s and in 1900s and 1910s, uh, you know, you saw a lot of what to then you know would be the I guess the equivalent of wealthier liberals today, if we want to use current uh, parlance, uh, who are uh, recognize the problems of the American working class and uh, want to fix them, but not by giving workers any power to do so. Yeah, you see that today. I mean, you know, I mean, look at, uh, I mean, you know, look at, I mean, not that I really even consider Howard Schultz a liberal, but like his whole, his whole reason for theoretically running for president, uh, unless it's kind of a, of, a, of a performance art piece, uh, <laughs> is that, you know, don't tax me, don't give workers any power, don't do any of these things, and, and I, I won't allow Donald Trump to be president for another term. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, then there's, there's look, we, we were coming out of a period where, you know, wealthier white liberals have been uh, dominant. Uh, forces in a democratic party, and they are largely, um, if not uncomfortable, rather indifferent, at the very least, to uh, worker, or, worker organizing. Sure, I mean, they, these could be problems. I think that, again, uh, the, challenge is to, um, the challenge is to organize and educate them. Uh, and to lead the way on it. You know, most people are going to follow. If you're going to lead uh, and you're going to provide a, an alternative uh, to the problems that we see today, a lot of people are going to get on board even if they're not fully comfortable with it. So, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not starry-eyed about white liberals, um, but I think that, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, a lot of them are going to be uncomfortable with it, but, you know, you work with them when you can, and when you can't, then you work against them. I, you know, I think it's, just, it's, just, it's a political coalition issue more than anything.
So going from agriculture to industrialization to manufacturing. And one of the things I noticed is that the United States economy is very different now than it was mm -hmm. years ago. It's not a manufacturing economy anymore. It's mostly a service economy, which is alluded to towards the end of the book. It's also an information and technology economy. And some of the most valuable companies in the United States are information and technology companies. And those workers are typically left out of the labor conversation. Yet their roles are somewhat means of production for those companies. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts and observations on the role of highly skilled science, technology, engineering, and workforce in the current economy. Well, I mean, obviously, it's a huge part of the current economy. I think that the challenge is organizing them. I mean, um, um, I mean, just, I mean, just as an example, again, within my own faculty union, the hardest people to organize are engineering faculty. Um, you know, they, they, they don't want anything to do with it. Um, and there is a strong libertarian uh, and misogynistic bent among among the field of in the field of engineering. Um, and uh, the, these are these and these are big challenges to organizing. I mean, if you want. You know, I mean, if you want to, you know, if you really want to see how hard this is going to be, like over here, these people have conversations in the airport and talk about what they do and, and talk about their ideas. And, and man, you hear some crazy stuff and some stuff that makes going to make it pretty hard to organize. And uh, so that's a big challenge. Um, and and I, I, I'm, you know, I don't think we're at a point yet. I haven't seen a lot of evidence there that that's a field where there is a lot of potential in the near future for organizing. However, look, I mean, these people are also, you have a culture of working 15-hour days. There's a lot of burnout. So I think hopefully at some point you have the development of some consciousness about this in that workforce, and, and, and maybe we begin to move in that direction. I, I think that's a big challenge. Um, and, I, and, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great point. What's that? Well, thank you. There I, or, organize your fellow engineers. That's what I would say. That, that's the challenge, right? Um, so a big uh, debate around Medicare for All right now is the fact that the status quo in the United States is employer-sponsored insurance, yeah. and the level to which we do it is very much anachronistic and an anomaly in the world. Um, I actually don't know if you personally support single payer or Medicare for all, but what's your advice on navigating um, discussions with workers who very rightfully are like, well, my job gives me this insurance, I'm like scared to go on to a public program that is not tied to my employer. And rather, and similarly, there are unions who are very reticent to talk about Medicare for all for that reason. Yeah, that's a great, that's an outstanding question. I mean, uh, two things. I mean, on the single payer debate, I think that there are many paths actually to an excellent, to excellent healthcare programs. The European nations have widely different, um, uh, widely different things. So I, I, I personally don't get too caught up on single payer, not because I oppose it, because I think there are many paths and we can find many paths to a much, much better healthcare system that fundamentally do more or less the same thing. I mean, Medicare for all, I think, I do like because it builds on something that we have. It builds on something concrete. It builds on something beloved. It, you know, even if it's problem, problematic. I mean, my parents are on it. We all know it does not the best in some ways. But it, you know, um, but there's a long history of unions not supporting public policy that would be good for a lot of people because it could potentially have a negative effect on them, right? That they put you put the they put the uh, the interests of their own members among, above the interests of the American working class. But I don't blame them for that per se. It's what they're paid for, right? I mean, I mean, we think that we have to think of unions. We want to think of unions as the leaders of the American left. And they could be, and sometimes they can be, but what they really are are responsive to particular workers who are paying dues to them over particular issues. And we have to recognize that. That is what a union is doing. That is what a union does. And sometimes that's going to mean they're not our allies on issues, especially that kind of issue, where they have a defined benefit that is probably maybe better than what they would get under a single-payer health care system. Um, it may not be better, but it's a risk. And why are they going to take that risk? Um, and you can argue, yeah, sure, you should put the uh, you should put the, uh, the the demands and the needs of the entire working class above your needs of your 150,000 members, or whatever it is that you, you have. Uh, they're probably going to blow you off. 
and say no, and you're just going to have to deal with it. So I don't think, I think that you, if they're, not, if, if they're not willing to get on board, you just move around them and realize they're not your allies on this issue and try to, try to talk to them, but don't, you know, when people aren't your allies, move on. That, that, I, think is, that I think is something that I would, I would generally say. Don't waste your time on people who aren't going to be your allies. Find people who are going to be your allies because most people don't know what's going on in the world, and they're there to be organized. And sometimes if they're not on certain issues, they will be on something else. You know, I mean, I think that I think that's my answer to you on that. That's hard, though. So, if I look at the history of unionism in this country, you know, the one commonality, um, you know, as disparate as the issues were, is desperation. Yeah. You know, the gift of desperation in a very complacent society. I mean, we talk about, you know, I think what a lot of Americans don't. You know, I was born here but raised in another country and. We're so well taken care of, right? I mean, the arms of the socialist government, you know, whether it's the price of gas or the price of stamps or whatever, I mean, you go somewhere else, and it's a large reality check. And so I think this is where, you know, like, I don't feel like that lesson really gets disseminated, you know, and I, and I get that, you know, the, the role of the employer the role of industry and in neoliberalism, you know, that whole, you know, the stuff that Noam Chomsky talks about is, you know, their message is so on. You know, they're very organized, right? The, the many actors, the many, the few powerful act as one. And why, you know, and it is our own demise. It always has been. In union and every other people problem is, oh, we're, Seven billion bloody individuals on a planet. Yeah. You know, so so that's where I think the number one thing in this country is, you know, we've been fed, we've been, you know, on the pit of complacency. Yeah, I mean, that's true, and and uh, you know, I think desperation is kind of coming back, and and and. and I mean, that's part of the reason why there's this move towards socialism because people are getting desperate. I think I think the the individualism is a huge issue too. I think that individual, look, we, we are now all empowered consumers to individual, and uh, that, okay, there could be some good things about that in terms of, of social expression, personal uh, priorities, and all these sorts of things, and it's not going away, but I also think that it is a negative side in that it does undermine solidarity, and it undermines the solidarity politics. I, sometimes I use a, a uh, you know, when we're talking about political engagement, on the left, too often I, I, I sort of feel like people come at political engagement like, like, hey, my, look at my new tattoo of politics. Isn't it awesome? And if a candidate doesn't do like that part of the tattoo and that part and that part, screw them. They don't stand for my issues. But sure there's a whole lot of me in that instead of a we. And I think that, and I, and I, and I think that we actually really struggle, even on the left, with a real culture of solidarity, a real culture of actually, I'm going to make a personal sacrifice. I'm going to, I might vote for somebody who I don't really like very much because it's going to hurt you when your child is locked in a cage on the border. It's going to hurt you in all of these other things, and not just, not just in terms of electoral politics, but generally. Like, you know, I, I think that we are hyper-individualistic consumers, and that infects our politics. And I use the word infect very intentionally. Um, we really need to develop cultures of solidarity that, uh, that uh, build toward a truly collective politics that may not follow our personal issues all the time, but that do build a world in which we can come together over what does unite us, and we can fight for that, and I can build knowledge. I can build understanding over the issues that matter to me that maybe don't matter as much to you, and we'll fight for them as we go forward. Um, yeah, that's a whole hell of a lot easier to say than do. But I do think we have to at least acknowledge the toxic role of extreme individualism in our politics that also exists. Hi, um, this is fascinating. I'm curious about, um, you mentioned that the demands that we need to be making going forward need to be much greater. And that, 
my interest from law club at this entire discussion. I'd love it if you could just name a few demands that you would like to see yeah. that are like shoot for the moon. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, well, the one thing I would I would recommend to everybody, you know, I mean, that, that's that's asking too much. I, I shouldn't say that, but what I've discovered in my life, at least, is that if you really want to be, become an expert on a very particular policy question, you just have to go do it, which is easier said than done too. Because as being a, being a professor, I have the luxury of being able to do that, right? So I recognize my own privilege in saying that. But I think, that, um, I, I think that there's actually a lot of room to set agendas on, on things. Um, and so, I mean, just on a personal level, I mean, just to can repeat things I've already said, the right to a job, right? That is a, that is a human right that we should have a, a, a bill that guarantees everybody a job that pays well and that has benefits. Uh, and there are many, many ways that we can do that. I had an op-ed in the New York Times arguing this back in April. Just as, I submitted just at the moment that Gillibrand and then Booker and then Bernie all announced a support for a similar program, so it actually got published. It was kind of amazing. It was like, best time of my life. Um, so that was, that was kind of cool. Um, I think that um, uh, the, the, the abolition of unpaid labor in prisons is a big one that I certainly believe in. It's a huge issue. I mean, the 13th Amendment barely applies in much of our country. We don't recognize that the 13th Amendment ends slavery. Slavery still exists. It exists in prisons. And we incarcerate so many people, including people of color, and that's been the case ever since 1865, that people realized we could again find ways to make black labor work for us for free, and we put them in prison. And uh, so that's, that's another one. I think that, uh, I think that my uh, the whole thing around uh, international labor law and limiting the ability of corporations to move and uh, applying uh, standards of labor, environmental, and human rights to workplaces around the world that open up American courts uh, to litigate those uh, is another example, but there could be so many. These are just ones I personally have written and worked on, you know, and I think that we, I think that, um, you know, we, just some of the things that we need to do is to think about, you know, if I really, if, if my big issue is, say, prisons, what are some of the, what are some of the really radical demands that I could make, you know, what, and, and, then, and then take those and actually think about how would I implement that? Right. How would that actually work so that if somebody challenges me on it, I can say, well, you could do these th A, B, and C, and maybe it's not the whole answer, but like I'm getting there, right? Um, and, and those are some things that, 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 I would, that I would argue. I would argue to take away school funding from cities and make it actually equitable across the nation so that white kids don't automatically get better educations than kids of color. Um, I think that's critical. You know, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of concrete demands that we could make that will scare people, but that's fine. I mean, you know, they were scared of the word socialism three years ago, right? And now people, like lots of people are into it. So, so I think that we just keep, I think we keep moving. I think we keep moving, we keep pushing left. I think right now a lot of the demands actually just remind me of 70s liberalism. Right? They, they remind me of, they, I mean, you know, the, the, you know the, 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 that's because a lot of these ideas were around in the 1970s. We're just getting back to that right now. Now, we'll, now it's time to start thinking about the next step. We have time for one more. One more. Yeah, I'm so as you just said, um, to many men we're looking forward, um, I wanted to say as a black woman and also as a woman that has six brothers that are African American, um, I see the domino effect of when you're unemployed, where the area of economic state, where it is police brutality, where it is and you know, imaginable numbers in prison where slavery is included, where it's human trafficking, there's a lot of it in there. So with that being said, what I want to know if there is, because the police, they have one of the biggest unions. Yeah. So how can the, especially the culture or the population that's getting treated unfairly and it's being proven over and over again, how can they create a union that can say, let's work together and make, because right now we see the facts, we see the truth. Yeah. But we're not asking you know, to help, we're just asking to work together. Yeah, that, okay, so that's pretty much the best possible question we could end with, uh, because what's more critical than this? Um, okay, one, I'm not going to sit here and say that we should bust the police unions per se. Um, I don't think there's any evidence really that there's not, there's really, there is evidence. 
that police that are not unionized are less brutal than police that are unionized. I do think, however, first of all, the police are never going to show solidarity with other unions. They're not going to show solidarity with you. They're not. I mean, they never, it, 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 it doesn't happen, right? It hasn't happened. You could theoretically radicalize the police, but <laughs> if that's happened, we already, if that's happened, we already have full communism, right? I mean, you know, so forget about that. So I think that we, I think this is a moment where, first of all, it actually is useful here to step away from the idea that unions should be, you know, this morally, you know, that we have a moral obligation to support unions. What unions do is they represent workers of interest in collective bargaining over particular kinds of issues. And those issues don't always have to actually coincide with the issues of the rest of the working class. And so as a public, when we have a unionized police force, we should have every right to, frankly, negotiate against them. To sit down and say these, you're, you know, the lack of a meaningful review board and the protections here, they're actually detrimental to the society that you're serving and that we as, we as a public want to collectively bargain those away and we think this is really important and we're going to fight for that. They're not going to like it, right? And, 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 you know, when you're talking about police issues, you're also talking about race issues because of the, the, you know, the, the support of the police and police brutality, the whole Blue Lives Matter thing, is, is an openly white supremacist movement. So that's what we're negotiating against. I think that in terms of moving forward, it's like a lot of issues. People of color have been fighting and dying over these issues forever. Police have been killing black people for no good reason since they arrived here in 1619. That's 400 years ago. And they're continuing to do it today. I think that the biggest, and, and, and I don't think that we can say, oh, you know, you should organize more over this. People are already organizing over it, right? I mean, people are organizing over for hundreds of years. And certainly since the 1960s, it's been central to the black freedom agenda. I think we have to ask is why don't white people care enough about this to do anything about it? Right? That's the question. Right? Why is it that we focus on these other issues? We sort of like, oh, yeah, that's bad. But then we don't do anything about it. That's the question I would ask, and I think that I think this is one of these areas where you have where where other people have to realize that even if the police aren't going to be brutal to you, um, although even personally my interactions with the police have always been very negative. And I'm not talking about a political protest. I'm just talking about like when my house has been robbed or something. You know, it's always been incredibly negative. But um, but I've never been had the fear of being pulled over and beaten or shot. And, uh, I, but I think that we, well, I, I need to take that seriously. We need to take that seriously, and we need to be allies on the front lines of demanding that there is real police accountability. And, 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 and because, you know, that's a race issue, it's a working class issue, it's the kind of issue that brings all these movements together, and that's why I think it's a great place to stop. So I want to just thank you all very, very much. Uh, two hours is a long time to sit. Um, it's more time than I deserve. And it's been really wonderful, and I just want to, again, uh, thank Joanna, thank DSA, thank the union for sponsoring me, and say you all are awesome, and have a wonderful night.